October 31st, 1517, the Eve, All Hallows Eve, as we call it, we call it Halloween here in English, but All Saints Eve, All Saints Day is uh, Holy Day of Obligation, it's Wednesday, November 1st, right? Uh, so Holy Day of Obligation of Masses, um, you find those in the bulletin, there's a 5 p.m. vigil, and then uh, 6, 9 a.m., 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 noon, 5 p.m., and 7 p.m. 7 p.m. is not in the bulletin, but it, we will be having a 7 p.m. on the Day of All Saints. But back on All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Eve, in 1517, a unique experience took place. Actually, it wasn't so unique for the town of Wittenberg, Germany. But the church door there was used for many different things. People would tack up, you know, selling a car, or I guess they weren't selling cars back then, but they were, you know, babysitting. And, um, but a disgruntled monk, Augustinian monk, tacked up 95 theses. His name was Martin Luther. It began the Protestant separation. We call it the Protestant Revolt. A lot of histories call it the Reformation. But if you're going to reform something, you stay on the inside and reform it. You don't leave it. And then 12 years later, adopt the title protest against it. That's where the word protestant, protestant comes from. Martin Luther died of Spire, that town where he met with the other separatists to protest the Catholic Church. That's what the word means. So in 1517, he does this. Why, why does, is there this explosion then away from the Catholic faith? Well, it didn't help that for a number of decades, there hadn't been much reform in the church. Four years before, there'd been the Fourth Council of Lateran there in Rome, which basically identified almost all the problems this, you know, that he saw in the church. But the Pope wasn't going to do anything about it, Pope Leo X. The previous pope is called the warrior pope. He was leading armies. That was Julius II. Previous pope before him, um, Alexander VI, he's the Borgia pope. And because we have kids here, we're not going to talk much about him. Right? So we have seen through history the successors of Peter. Even Peter denied the Lord three times. They're all sinners. John Paul II went to confession every day. But unfortunately, in, in the mid to late 1400s, leading up to the early 1500s, because there's a need, so much a need for reform, this is the spark that just lit the fire. Um, and you see this separation that takes place in the 1500s to the point now that how many Christian religions are there in the world? 30,000. If you were Christian in 1510, you were either Catholic or Orthodox. That was it. If you were a Christian, before the year 1050, you were Catholic. There was nothing else. 1054 is when the break happened with the Orthodox. So the first 1,000 years after Christ, if you were a Christian, there was only one Christian religion, the Catholic Church. Okay. And so when Martin Luther broke away, he had to protest the church. And there are two basic points that I think we need to, well, we need to, there are many that he, he had basically 10 points, but we're not going to go through all 10. There are a couple things that he identified here that we as Catholics should know how to speak with our separated brethren. I grew up in, I grew up in Georgia in the 1970s. I didn't know Catholics could live in the same neighborhood together. Right? We, had, you know, we had great Southern Baptist neighbors or Methodists, but to be able to have a conversation with them, without emotion, not an argument, just let's just have a discussion. What's the truth? You know, the truth sets free. Let's talk about it. We're not afraid of that as Catholics. And we're honest enough to, to admit, well, we've had, you know, we've had sinners. We've had sinful popes. Not one of them ever taught on a matter of faith and morals for the entire church an error that another pope had to come along and change, or was that against another, another pope that the church, against the church's teaching, even though they were sinners? So what was Martin Luther's, Martin Luther's argument against the church? Well, first he said indulgences, right? I wouldn't think, you don't want to go with some of your friends who are non-Catholic and say, hey, let's talk about indulgences. That, that might be a, a non-starter. What's an indulgence? Well, if you recall in Matthew's Gospel, 
chapter you know, 16 and Matthew chapter 18. When, Peter, when our Lord's talking to Peter in Matthew 16, what does he say to Peter? Thou art rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the great gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, Peter and his successors have the authority, not only in this world, but extends into the next, to bind and to loose. So Jesus Christ never talked about fasting on Ash Wednesday or Good Friday. We're bound to do it, those of us 18 to 59, under pain of mortal sin, we just blow it off. Say, I'm not going to do it. That's the authority the church has. But then our bishop can also, on a Friday of Lent, say, you're dispensed from meat because it's St. Patrick's feast day. Right, right. He can do that. Because that's Matthew 18 when our Lord's speaking to all the apostles, not just to Peter. We bind our should be bound in heaven, loosen our should be loose in heaven. He says it twice. This is what an indulgence is. It's where the successor of Peter, successor of, you know, the vicar of Christ, has this authority where he actually can bind or loose in this world and in the next. So an indulgence is where the Holy Father attaches time off purgatory, called it that way, all right, remission of temporal punishment due to sin, the formal way, for maybe prayers or actions. So, for instance, All Saints Day is November the 1st. All Souls Day, praying for all the souls in purgatory is the next day, right? And all of November is dedicated to praying for the poor souls. Well, those first eight days of November, we can get a plenary indulgence, in other words, a full remission of temporal punishment due to sin for a soul in purgatory, right? If what? Well, if we attend Mass that day, receive Holy Communion, we pray for the intention of the Pope and our Father, Hail Mary, glory be. Been to confession within eight days before or after, okay? We're free from all attachment due to sin, which is really the, the you know, the kicker, right? And then I do the, the, the indulgence work, as we call it, where the Pope can say, okay, in this case, it's visiting a cemetery and praying for the dead. He can do that. That's called an indulgence. Okay? And it can be a full indulgence, or if I'm, don't, if I'm not quite sorry for all attachment due to sin, it can be a partial. Right? It's not where we get into the minutia and we get lost, and like, okay, what is, how much of this and how many days? Well, no, that would be defeat kind of what we're trying to do here. It's all out of love. You know, and I'm actually interceding for those in purgatory in this case, in this particular case. Could be praying the rosary before the Blessed Sacrament. Could be reading the scriptures for 30 minutes before the Blessed Sacrament. Those are indulgence works. So it's, this is the authority, though, the Pope has. So in the early 1500s, what was the Pope, what had he attached an indulgence? Well, they're trying to build St. Peter's. He said, well, if, you're gonna, if you make a donation, we will give an indulgence. Now, granted, in Germany, the priest was in charge of it. His name was Tetzel. And that priest... It's almost, the language gets pretty tight. It's like, are you selling spiritual things here? Because that's called simony. That's a terrible sin. You don't sell sacraments. You don't sell indulgences. You don't tell, sell time off purgatory. But some of the terminology in going out in Germany at the time was, yeah, you look at it, it's like, mm, all right, somebody's going off here. But the official teaching of the church, no, we don't sell spiritual things. That's simony, right? That's a terrible sin. It's always been condemned by the church, right? It's condemned right in the New Testament, right? So it's, and this is where, that was his primary argument. But it was a misunderstanding of, okay, the church has this authority. But then, what were his two basic beliefs? It's faith alone and scripture alone. Let's not forget, Martin Luther had a tragic life. He struggled terribly with scrupulosity. He would go to confession for hours, himself in the confessional for hours, okay, in a day, okay? Scrupulosity is where I see sin where it isn't, or I see something as a serious sin where it's maybe a venial sin. But it's a terrible, it's, it's, it's something really, it's hard for pe people to deal, it's hard, okay? And unfortunately, he had that struggle. And it, it's unfortunate that he, he went the way he did. But faith alone allowed him to get past that. He, he, cho he chose this, the verse from Romans, where man is saved by faith regardless of works. 
And that was his, that was it. Okay, that was, and he was already teaching this a few months before he tacked those, uh, those 95 theses up. And that became the basis of his belief. And it's the basis of many are separated brethren. How many of you have ever been asked by a fellow Christian, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? That's where it comes from. Right? That you're saved by the merits of Jesus Christ regardless of works. That's not taking the Holy Scripture and all of the New Testament into consideration. That's proof texting. You've got your own belief in your head. I'm going to find that belief now in this one sentence. Well, why not take your own Why not focus? Why not take all your, all your religious belief on when our Lord says, if your eyes the problem, pluck it out, or your hands the problem, cut it off? Why not that one? See how problematic that becomes. See, the church has the, has the authority to guide us properly as far as what is the proper interpretation okay, of Scripture. Scripture itself does not, fa- does not say faith alone. St. James' letter in the New Testament, James himself, so this is our Lord inspiring James to write. It's a new book in the New Testament, the Word of God. Faith without works is dead. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith with works. Very clear. That's why Martin Luther said, I want to throw Jimmy in the river, speaking of the book of James. Right? It didn't match up with his beliefs. So it, but is there a balance? Well, yeah. If, if I'm so focused on okay, did I do this right? Did I, do, did, I, I mean, did I have all these prayers done and check, 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 check? Okay, yeah, it, again, it's, it's love, right? right? It's because I, I know this is my Lord that loves me, so I re- love begets love, okay? And then what was the second, his second teaching? Well, Scripture alone. Scripture alone is your authority for what you believe. Now, does it say that in Scripture? Is does not say that in Scripture. He used the second letter of Timothy, chapter 3, to say all Scripture is inspired by God and valid for reproof, for correction, for teaching. All is not only. And that's the way he taught it. And so many of our separated brethren, this is what they believe. Only Scripture, that's your only source of authority. But that becomes problematic, doesn't it? Because who's going to be your authority to interpret when you have a conflict? Well, then it becomes you personally, and that's what he taught. And that's what, so that's, and that is not, that that was new. 1,500 years. This doesn't match up with history, these beliefs. It's unhistorical, it's unscriptural. Even though he did accept the church's authority to give us the New Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament in 393, he didn't accept the church's authority anymore, though, to interpret it. That seems to be a conflict. So, when, you know, someone may say, well, my Scripture, this is, my, this, is my, this is my authority. Does Scripture say that? Scripture doesn't say that. It says all Scripture is inspired by God, not only Scripture. Because all the truths that our Lord gave to the apostles to the, and to the, that the Holy Spirit gave to the apostles of the death of St. John, we have all those. Not all of them are written down. People didn't have the New Testament in the first few decades. How did they learn about Jesus Christ? The oral teaching, we call it traditional with a capital T. Okay? And that's very clear in the New Testament. St. Paul writes about it a couple times. It's the written word and the spoken word we're called to believe. We still have that spoken word. That's all the teaching of the church. That's the catechism. Most of those are written down. Most of our teachings can be found right there in the Scriptures. But Jesus didn't write anything down. He didn't write a book. He founded a church and said, go teach all things I have commanded you. Go teach all nations everything I have commanded you. That's the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Right? So that church, out of that church comes the New Testament. And it's that church that says only these 27 books are inspired by God. So it's really helpful for us to have a basic understanding of this. So it, when we have conversations, and there, are there ways that we can go to find answers? Catholic.com, Catholic Answers is very good. Okay. Patrick Madrid, Scott Hahn, there, there are so many of them out there okay, to help to explain. All right. But it's good for us, especially when we're challenged. And it's not bad to be challenged. By, at least people have the zeal to challenge us in the faith. But then do I have the willingness 
to actually to do my homework. If I say, well, I don't, I don't know that. And I'll just finish with this one last story, a true story. A young Marine, he was 18 years old, at Camp Lejeune down in North Carolina. And he was challenged by an older Marine who was a Bible-thumping evan evangelical. And it's the evangelical who tells the story, not the youngster. The evangelical was bent on pulling as many Catholics out of the church as he possibly could do. So he starts challenging this young 18-year-old. And the 18-year-old says, you know, that's a good point. I, you know, I don't have the answer, but let me, let me get back to you. A few days later, he said, hey, I got the answer for you. Here it is. Kind of made sense, but then the older guy knew his, how to go about this, so he immediately jumps to another you know, seeming contradiction in the Catholic Church's teachings and Scripture. And the young your Marine says, uh, you know, let me do some, let me get back to you. A few days later, he's got the answer. This went on until finally the older evangelical ran out of questions and he converted to Catholicism. Right? He became a Catholic, so did his brother. His brother's a priest in our diocese. Brother Staples down in Orange. And his brother, Tim Staples, right? Apologetic. Apologetic for, you know, apologist for the faith. And you know what that young Marine was doing? He was calling his priest up in D.C., asking him. See, it, it's not, it's not, it, it does, we don't lose anything by saying, you know, I, I don't quite have, and I'm not going to get into argument, don't want to do that, so, well, let me, let me do some homework or do some reading or let me get on the internet and go to this website and I can get the answer. Okay. Or maybe we just give them a, a book to read. You know, there are hundreds of Protestant ministers who have converted in the United States of America in the last 30 years, last 35 years. Hundreds of them. A lot of them are written and talked about their conversion. They've done all this for us. So maybe we can, you know, just to be our Lord's instrument to bring his truth to others so that they can have the fullness of the faith that he established and prayed that all may be one as you, Father, and me, and I, and you. May Almighty God bless you through the Mac and heart of Mary.